Good morning. My name is Ann Morris, Annie Morris, and I'll be leading today's service. Our minister, Matt Alspa, will be presenting our message this morning. Our opening words. Sunday after Sunday, we gather for worship, renewing our connection with others who gather like us, remembering our history, the gatherings week after week, a thousand years old or more. The ancient ways, the time-honored traditions offering comfort and reassurance, but tradition can become tiresome, and the old rituals grow rigid and mechanical, drained of meaning, devoid of love, of life. So we turn to face into the future, feeling the warm rays of a new dawn of renewed hope, of possibility, trying new things, making a new path. Feeling, too, our fears, our worries, the tyranny of choice. Do we live into a dream or a mirage? May we meld together both the comfort of the past and the potential of the future as we find ourselves here now in this singular Sunday morning, in this particular present moment. Come, let us worship together. And so now I just want to welcome you with Live from Fellowship Hall, it's our LCUUF Sunday service. <clears throat> our announcements were on a slideshow before the service. If you didn't see them, don't worry, they were sent out by email yesterday with the order of service for today. A few notes, our building is now open to all for in-person services. We continue to offer our service on Zoom each Sunday for those who are unable to attend in person. Wearing masks within the fellowship building is required at this time. I note that our director of music, Michael Reason, is ill with COVID at this time and will not join us today. And now a special welcome to our visitors. If you're visiting with us for the first time or have returned or reconnected after a long absence, we invite you to say your name and tell us where you're from. If you're on Zoom, use the Zoom raise hand feature or just turn on your video and wave your hand and we'll ask you to unmute. If you're in the room, just raise your hand. We'll start with the people in the room. No newbies, no returnees. All right. So now let's switch to those on Zoom. Is there anyone new with us on Zoom? I don't see any raised hands. OK. Please note that we offer a wide variety of services on various topics presented by our members, outside guests, as well as our minister, Reverend Matt Alspa. We hope you will return to sample this variety of thought and belief. Our chalice lighting words today are by Kimberly Ann Tomchek Carlson, a UU minister in Wisconsin, USA. We are a people of memory. As inheritors of our ancestors' legacy, we hold their stories tenderly, gleaning wisdom from diverse journeys, united in hope for the future. Guide us to trust in love as we kindle this flame together. Now let us light our chalice with these words that we sing together. Our opening hymn is Morning Has Broken by the British writer Eleanor Fajan. Please rise as you are willing and able and join me in singing. Where God's feet pass, my 
Each week, we take time to remind ourselves that we belong to a community which cares for each other. We do this by sharing any significant joys or sorrows in our lives. If you have a joy or sorrow to share today, you can type it into the chat now and we'll read these aloud. First, let us recall the joys. Whatever you may be celebrating, whatever evokes a feeling of peace or joy for yourself or others, you on Zoom are welcome to type joys in the chat box. We'll start with the joys with the folks here. Are there any joys that people would like to share here in the room? No joy. <laughs> All right. Good morning, I'm Andrea, and I was adopted at birth and was raised as an only child, and uh, I just did my DNA ancestry, and I now have three blood sisters and a stepbrother, and I made my reservations this week to go visit them for the very first time. Wow. Okay, the ice has been broken, and I have a joy that just happened this morning. My youngest son, youngest at 48, um, called to tell me that the kids are plotting and scheming for a get-together, me and them, um, on the occasion of my 80th birthday. And it's a big surprise, so thank goodness for tattletales. <laughs> are there any joys to be shared? Oh, we did that, sorry. Oh, there are any joys to be shared on Zoom, sorry. Yes, there are. Uh, first, a joy from Fred and Mardell Harland. We are pleased that Mardell's medical issues are being addressed and she is feeling somewhat better. Our heartfelt thanks to all who took the time to be in touch. We very much appreciated the messages of concern and support. Then from Trudy, I would like to share a joy for Lou's 80th birthday this Thursday. And a joy for me. Uh, somehow this is an emotional time at our house. My first joy is that we're all recovering okay from COVID, Carol, Evelyn, and myself. And then I want to express deep joy for all that we have been given, life, health, family, and friends. I am grateful for all that I've been given. That's it for the joys. Now let us voice our sorrows or concerns. Whatever you or the world may be holding that is in need of our caring and healing thoughts, you're welcome to type sorrows and concerns in the chat box. Again, we'll start with the folks here in the room. Are there any sorrows or concerns that people would like to share here in the room? Hola, good morning. I am Francisco Ursua. My concern is because my sister Norma Ursua last Wednesday died. She was 52 years. Uh, she died of diabetes. Rest in peace. Thank you. Uh, please light a candle of 
hope, which is perhaps the path between sorrow and joy for our family as we navigate the waters of forgiveness that hopefully will lead us to the shores of reconciliation and home. Thank you. My um, concern is for my husband, Terry, who's been um, ill since last Sunday. Um, Dr. Hernandez, who he has seen recently, uh, feel that it's probably salmonella versus a parasitic condition. Uh, he was treated for dehydration, um, antibiotics, uh, extra vitamins, uh, but um, He's still struggling, so your prayers would be, or positive thoughts would be appreciated. Are there any sorrows to be shared on Zoom? Uh, yes, there are. First, a joy that I didn't get last time from Colleen Berry, uh, having a lovely visit with my daughter and her boyfriend here at Lakeside and feeling blessed. Then a uh, concern from Liz Mulder, a big concern for the victims of the intense heat wave in the U.S. and England and a joy that so many of us here in Mexico are avoiding at least that weather crisis. And then for me, I want to conclude with our grief at what has been lost during these years of pandemics and times of political turmoil, war in Ukraine and climate disasters affecting hundreds of millions of people around our planet. We're losing many things we love and feel grief at their passing. And that's it. And this candle from our care team represents those sorrows that are too raw, too difficult to share aloud. So many of us have had losses, partners, children, grandchildren, pets, losses that remain present with us every day. So many of us have burdens, anger, fear, and frustration, all of those things that weigh heavy on our hearts. We light this candle for all those unspoken sorrows. Let us share a moment of silence to hold in our hearts both the sorrows and the joys that have been shared this morning. This reading is Letter to the People of the Future by John Cummins, a Unitarian Universalist minister. He writes, My distant children, you will look back on us with astonishment at the truths which stared us in the face and which we did not see. You will look with wonder at the bright toys we created and used only for the rape of the planet and one another. It will seem strange to you beyond believing that we reached for the stars and did not know the simplest keys for living well together. But know this all, you of the future, you with your libraries and fountains, you with your star cities. Know that even in our slumbers we dreamed, in our fumbling, shadowed search for mistaken glories, even in our clumsy cruelties, it was for you that we dreamed. Beneath the piled-up centuries, below the lost and ruined rubble of all our striving, it was you who lay safe and folded in the womb of our dreaming, you, the first cause of all our daring. Even now it brings comfort to know that it shall one day be as the wise among us have foretold. In that far age and the chrysalis of time, it will be your source of pride that your ancestors, born into a universe without justice or mercy, 
bethought themselves of justice and mercy and put them there. Remember us for this. Well, let us enter it now into a time of meditation. Just a simple time to relax, to get comfortable, to perhaps focus your attention on maybe a flame behind me or maybe a screen. Um, just something to put your eyes at rest on as um, we spend a couple of minutes in silence. And let us return now to this time and this place to be together with each other again. We need a shorter pasture. Uh, <laughs> this is an excerpt from a longer TED Talk in Victoria, British Columbia by psychologist Dan Gilbert. You can ask people about their likes and dislikes, their basic preferences. For example, name your best friend, your favorite kind of vacation, what's your favorite hobby, uh, what's your favorite kind of music. People can name these things. We ask half of them to tell us, do you think that that will change over the next 10 years? And half of them to tell us, do you did that change over the last 10 years? And what we find, well, you've seen it twice now and here it is again. People predict that their fr the friend they have now is the friend they'll have in 10 years. The vacation they most enjoy now is the one they'll enjoy in 10 years. And yet, people who are 10 years older all say, eh, you know, that's really changed. Does any of this matter? Is this just a form of misprediction that doesn't have consequences? No, it matters quite a bit, and I'll give you an example of why. It bedevils our decision-making in important ways. Bring to mind right now for yourself your, your favorite musician today and your favorite musician 10 years ago. I put mine up on the screen to help you along. Now, we ask people to predict for us, to tell us how much money they would pay right now to see their current favorite musician perform in concert 10 years from now. And on average, people said they would pay $129 for that ticket. 
And yet when we asked them how much they would pay to see the person who was their favorite 10 years ago perform today, they say only $80. Now in a perfectly rational world, these should be the same number, but we overpay for the opportunity to indulge our current preferences because we overestimate their stability. Why does this happen? We're not entirely sure, but it probably has to do with the ease of remembering versus the difficulty of imagining. Most of us can remember who we were 10 years ago, but we find it hard to imagine who we're going to be. And then we mistakenly think that because it's hard to imagine, it's not likely to happen. Sorry, when people say, I can't imagine that, they're usually talking about their own lack of imagination and not about the unlikelihood of the event that they're describing. The bottom line is, time is a powerful force. It transforms our preferences, it reshapes our values, it alters our personalities. We seem to appreciate this fact, but only in retrospect. Only when we look backwards do we realize how much change happens in a decade. It's as if, for most of us, the present is a magic time. It's a watershed on the timeline. It's the moment at which we finally become ourselves. Human beings are works in progress that mistakenly think they're finished. The person you are right now is as transient, as fleeting, and as temporary as all the people you've ever been. The one constant in our life is change. Thank you. Ah, yeah, yeah. This is just, you'll hear me better. Let me check this over here. Okay. <laughs> so, those of you who've read my uh, newsletter columns, the LCUF newsletter columns, may recall that I recently mentioned the work of future forecaster Jane McGonigal, who works at the Institute for the Future in California. She caught my attention because over 10 years ago, she predicted many aspects of the coronavirus pandemic. Now, not the, so much the medical or biological aspects, but the social and political aspects. She predicted that there would be issues with things like mask wearing and social distancing. She also anticipated the intentional spread of misinformation and conspiracy theories. But what really got my attention was that she first saw that when people were told to stay home, to go into lockdown, the number one reason that they would violate these rules was to be able to go to religious services. And as we've learned, religious services were as, and I quote her, the number one super spreader risk worldwide. So I, Matt, felt a little bad as a religious professional to be one of the bad guys in the whole pandemic experience. I mean, I get enough grief already in this line of work, being lumped in with all the televangelists and the snake handlers and the floppy Bible fundamentalists. Now I had to wonder if my actions had led anybody to get sick or die. So I was grateful that McGonigal suggested that we religious leaders needed to go virtual, for that's what we'd already done here at LCUEF. And as this pandemic doesn't seem to be ending, but keeps coming at us in wave, we're here at wave number five here in Mexico, I'm glad we found a way through that allows us to stay connected and still protect ourselves. So how do you predict the future? Is it all crystal balls or tarot cards or reading palms? Or is it supervisionary types sitting in their armchairs dreaming of future worlds? or focus groups of highly paid experts at a table full of coffee cups and croissants debating future possibilities? Or is it running complex supercomputer simulations predicting the changes of a hundred numerical variables? All these methods have been used by forecasters to try to grasp a sense of the future. McGonigal's approach is a little different. She makes it all a game. In the book, her book, Imaginable, she tells her story. 
She started out as a game designer working on massive multiplayer computer games. And she realized that imagining the future could also be done as a massive cooperative online game. This formed the basis for that pandemic study back in 2009. She created a massive worldwide game or simulation, that's a fancier word, involving about 10,000 participants. She simply presented people with a scenario, a respiratory pandemic. Now remember, this was not too many years after the first SARS COVID pandemic in 2002 to 2004. She asked them questions about how they would change their habits and their lives to cope. Would they self-isolate? Could they work at home? What about their kids? And so on. It was insights from their answers that included these surprising realizations that I mentioned earlier about going to worship and stuff like that. People said they would still go to church even if they died getting there. And as we saw in the video by psychologist Dan Gilbert, we have a tendency to think that the future will be a lot like the present, only more so. Now, without nudges, without a push, we will just rather unconsciously assume that things five or ten years out will be more or less the same as today. So part of this futurist work is to try to break out of this unconscious sameness. So let's do a little exercise, one from McGonagall's book. And I'll warn you in advance, I'm not going to ask anybody to stand up and say what they came up with or anything like this. This is just personal. I hope that gives you some more freedom and relaxation to do this. So let's start by looking in the past. Recall, recall a day 10 years ago, that is this summer in 2012. Now as vividly as possible, recall what a typical day was like for you then. Where were you? What were you doing? Who was with you? What things were you excited about? What things were you worried about? We'll take a few moments just in silence to visualize that time in our minds. So I'm going to guess that for most of you, perhaps even all of you, a lot of things were different 10 years ago. Maybe where you lived, perhaps who you were with, maybe your desires or goals and worries. How much was different? For me, I lived in a different country then, and I served a different church with very different problems. Even my morning routine was different. I had a different meditation practice then, a different exercise program, and I ate different things for breakfast. Well, now let's do something a little more challenging. Let's go 10 years into the future. It's now July 24th, 2032. Now look, if that's too far for you, you can go into the future as far as you can. But apparently, psychologists tell us that 10 years is kind of the magic number to get us far enough out that we kind of let go of being about ourselves. So again, imagine yourself waking up on that morning in 2032. Where are you? Who is with you? What's your morning routine like? What are you going to do that day? What excites you? What worries you? Again, we'll take a few moments, but try to be as vivid as you can. What colors do you see? What scents do you smell? How are you feeling? We'll take a few moments.
So for me, in my imagined time 10 years from now, I get up early and meditate, joining an online meditation group just for company. We all have our mics muted. I eat a, ve a vegan breakfast, and this is a lot easier to do due to the number of tasty vegan products available now. Liz and I live in a small communal housing setup with six other people in four colorful casitas in an old Ahihik property. But I'm a little anxious this day because we're all in this little community meeting with a group, the group facilitator, who is an outside person who counsels our community on how to get along with each other and make big group decisions. It's good because we worry about the increasing healthcare needs of one of our members, our neighbor, who has been resistant to making changes. So you might wanna play with this exercise a little later to go deeper, maybe even journaling or however you like to you know, make notes, to think about how you might see your future self living. Okay, and here's a bonus exercise. What will this fellowship LCUUF look like 10 years from now? What would visiting it look like? Where is it located? Who attends? What kind of programs are going on? We're not gonna take some time now because I'm, I'm sure we will return to this exercise sometime in the future. It could be a powerful tool for us. Consider this. One of the things that McGonagall mentioned about the pandemic simulation really caught my attention. When the COVID pandemic hit, this one, in early 2020, McGonagall started getting messages from people who had been in that simulation, that pandemic simulation, over 10 years ago. And they said things like, in their emails, things like, I'm not freaking out. I've already worked through the panic and the anxiety when we imagined it 10 years ago. Or, I'm starting to prepare for this now. And this was before the pandemic was even really getting started. Remember back in January, February, early March of 2020? These people had already had a bit of an experience of pandemic, even in a simulation, and they were better pre prepared for the real thing. And that's when I said, I want that. I want some resilience for the future. I discovered that McGonagall and the Institute for the Future are running an online membership group called Urgent Optimists. I decided to join just to learn more about future forecasting and future simulations. Now, one of the part of this program, and it's all online, has been to consider how you might react in the moment to various small situations scenarios that might occur in the future, maybe even the, in the near future. So this month's scenario was called, Don't Face Search Me. Now I'm abbreviating the scenario script, which goes like this, so I quote, somewhere in public a few years from today, you're minding your own business when you notice someone discreetly raising their phone. They're pointing the camera lens in your direction at your face. Just a quick flick of the wrist. It happens so fast you almost miss it. But you know what they're doing. They just face searched you. A couple seconds later, they're looking at their screen, no doubt finding out your name, age, and what other, other personal details they've set in their face search parameters for. This is the first time you've personally been face searched, or at least the first time you've noticed. Imagine this scene as vividly as you can. And so I answered, and I quote myself, I'm out having a lunch with a friend when this happens. And actually in my mind, <laughs> I visualize having a lunch with, with Chris Gang, our board president. We meet monthly to talk about our board meetings coming up. So I'm out having lunch with Chris, and I'm not terribly bothered. Depending on how my lunch with Chris is going, and if my friend is okay with the interruption, I might choose to face check this person back. Now, this is not seen as a retaliatory gesture, but more as a potential opportunity to connect online in the future. 
or maybe even to interrupt our lunches to just go over and say hi. Now, why did I come to this point of view? Well, first, I'm a bit of a public person in this town as the minister of this congregation, so I'm used to being recognized. But secondly, I suffer from a little bit of face blindness, admittedly self-diagnosed. I have trouble recognizing faces and coming up with the names that are associated with them. So this could, in fact, be an assistive technology for me. In this scenario, I'm being optimistic about the... Oh, this is, this is, I think, the really important point for me. I'm being optimistic about the future of privacy, which will give us greater control over our personal data and how it gets shared, along with legal protections, much like the current e European Union's right to be forgotten laws, which require that certain information be deleted from public internet records if you request it. So after I answered, I found myself more on the optimistic, excited side of things, which is the orange side here on this graph, while most of the other scenario participants were worried or concerned over on the blue side. Now, you might think this is crazy stuff, these, but these signals of change are already there. When I went through TSA on my last trip in the USA, the agent told me he didn't need to see my ID or my boarding pass. He pointed to a camera above him looking down at me. And today you can play with a face search tool on the web. Pim Eyes is trying to provide face search tools for the rest of us, competing with the likes of Facebook, Google, and Amazon who sell to the big guys. You can do free searches on, the we on their website by scanning your face with your camera and letting it search. I was relieved to learn that while my face shows up a lot, fortunately, most all of these are on church websites. <laughs> now, one of the things that I notice thinking about how we imagine the future is that it parallels the Buddhist idea of impermanence. This is one of the most fundamental teachings of Buddhism, that things don't stay the same. They change. They arise and fade away. And when we want things to stay the same, and they don't, this leads to discontent and suffering for us. So in imagining the future, we have to be willing to push aside our natural tendency to imagine things staying the same. Now, admittedly, much of the change that the Buddhists speak of is change in our own condition. We grow older. Sickness and debility comes. We're encouraged to avoid clinging to an image of some unchanging self, to accept that our bodies and our minds are in a process of change. But future work invites us to consider impermanence on a more global scale. Our communities, our society, the whole world changes. And in the same way, we need to learn to detach, to neither cling to or push away those future changes. So here's the thing. Some of the changes in the future will be positive and some will be negative. But most are a mix of good and bad. And it's hard to discern the difference, especially in the moment. Only from the vantage point of even more years in the future might we understand what has really happened to see the deep meaning. Maybe these heat waves this week in Europe and the central USA and Canada will be looked back upon as the thing that finally kicked us into serious work on climate change. Maybe the war in Ukraine might shift how nations view wars of aggression. Only if we're able to detach from clinging and aversion may we be able to see all the interconnected possibilities that might emerge in the future. But enough about Buddhism. What about Unitarian Universalism? One of the reasons I fell in love with Unitarian Universalism when I encountered it almost 35 years ago is that it offered a hopeful, optimistic future. Many of our hymns and readings, like that 
reading earlier, letter to the people of the future, offered a vision of a future world that would be more peaceful, more just, more loving, just generally better than the one, the world of the present. And we'll sing one of those optimistic hymns in a moment, with joy reclaim the growing light. Now, admittedly, the world trend has not been one of steady, unwavering improvement. We've not seen progress onward and upward forever, to use an old line in our tradition. We've had some setbacks and some disappointments. It's sometimes hard to look past those upsets and imagine a hopeful, progressive future. But I think that's an important skill. You see, years ago, I took a motorcycle safety course, and one of the first riding lessons was, look left, go left. Look right, go right. Learn to look where you want to go, and the bike will follow. It's a general rule, to be sure, but a good one. And I think the same thing is true about looking to the future. If we are only able to imagine a dystopian future, that's likely the world will get. On the other hand, if we're able to look to an optimistic future, we'll be well on our way to creating it. Again, a general rule, more likely to be true than not, at least I think so. So about the future. I know it'll be different than today, and I accept that. I don't know exactly what it'll look like, and I accept that too. But as I imagine the future, let me choose hope. Let me choose an optimistic view. Stealing lines from the hymn we'll sing, let me choose a world of advancing thought, widening view, a world with more good to see. Blessed be. You're perfect, actually. This is the first, this is the time in our service when we ask you to remember that we share our gifts here through pledging and donations. Instructions for payments to the fellowship are on a slide during the announcements before the service every week. For the people here at the fellowship, we'll pass a basket. And while you're considering your gifts to the fellowship, remember that each month LCUUF donates 5,000 pesos or more to an organization in our lakeside community. We share one half of the offering collected at the fellowship each week with that organization. For the month of July, we're supporting Operation Feed in San Juan Cosala. For over 30 years, Operation Feed volunteers have been providing food and improving the lives of the very poor and marginalized people of the village of San Juan Cosala. They provide weekly food dispenses to 150 families and individuals who would go hungry without the aid. Many of the recipients are elderly, disabled, and children. Operation Feed also supports new program initiatives like cooking classes and crochet projects to involve the people in developing additional income sources and skills. Operation Feed's goal is to help those people live productive lives free from hunger. If you're not attending the fellowship in person, please donate to share the basket when you pay your pledge. Donate to share the basket separately or indicate what part of your donation is for share the basket. The offering has now been given and received. Our closing hymn is With Joy We Claim the Growling Light by Samuel Longfellow, a Unitarian minister and hymn writer. Please rise and join me in singing. With joy we claim the growing light, advancing thought and widening view. The larger freedom, clearer sight, which from the old unfold the new. With wider view come loft your gold, with fuller light, more good to see. With freedom, true self. Control. 
May we claim the growing light. May we imagine a brighter future full of possibility and hope, one for which our distant children will look back and remember us in pride. May we, in our imaginations, be motivated to act, to respond, to do, that we may create that future world, a place of justice and mercy, endowed with fuller light and clearer sight. May it be so. Let us extinguish our chalice with these words, which we read together. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we keep in our hearts and share with all the world. Yeah. 